So today we will discuss about um, solidarity and security of gas supply. Uh, why? Because recently uh, we had uh, uh, interesting news about the approval uh, by the European Parliament in the plenary on 12th of September of the revised security of gas supply regulation, which, uh, as we know, uh, builds upon and actually modifies the previous version, which is from 2010. So what we will be discussing today is uh, what this uh, new regulation brings uh, to the table and to Europe, to European gas market in general. Um, and we will see with, uh, with our uh, speakers uh, if uh, actually solidarity, which gives the title to our debate, will be actually enabled uh, with the help of this, uh, of this new regulation. But before getting into um, the, the issue, before getting into the debate, let me uh, just first uh, um, give you a few um, uh, informa a little information about how this, the debate will be structured. So we will have a discussion uh, with our speakers of about, which will last for about half an hour. Uh, I will ask them a few questions and they will, they will all reply and uh, uh, bring to the table the issues that they feel are more important and interesting for the discussion. At the same time, um, participants are invited to already start uh, commenting or writing, com or writing questions in the box that you find here. Uh, where you can read Q&A discussion forum. Um, the real uh, debate with the participants will take place in the second half of uh, this hour, so uh, approximately uh, around uh, half past ten. Uh, I will be collecting uh, the questions. I will try to see if there are some questions which can be grouped and uh, uh, then uh, ask them to, to the speakers who will have the chance to, to reply directly to you. So you have the chance really to, to discuss with them about this interesting topic. Um, this said, I hope you will uh, enjoy this debate. Uh, it will be, uh, I think, quite instructive, um, particularly for the ones of you who follow this uh, long-lasting debate on security of gas supply and how to make really secure supplies to Europe, which, as we know, is one of the pillars of um, the European energy policy since forever. Okay, let me introduce you to uh, the uh, distinguished panel of speakers that, uh, that we have today. Uh, I'm welcoming Andris Pibals, former energy commissioner and senior fellow at the Florence School of Regulation. Walter Bolz, former Vice Chair of the Acer Board of Regulators and Vice President of the Council of European Energy Regulators here. And uh, we, had, we uh, were planning to have Hendrik Pollex, uh, who is ENSO Business Area Manager, but unfortunately he could not participate. Well, we are lucky enough to, to have uh, today Jan Ingversen, who is also uh, working for ENSO, and he is the Secretary General. So let's say a more political perspective, uh, more regulators' perspective, and a rather NSOG, uh, T TSO's related perspective. So I hope it will be a, a complete debate from, from this point of view. This uh, said, let's start. So um, my first question to the speakers is, um, what does this new uh, security of gas supply regulation bring uh, to the table? Um, to use, um, to use, so can you hear me? Yes, we do. Yes. Okay, sorry. Yes, yes. Um, to hear, to, to use the, the words of uh, uh, Jerzy Buzek, uh, who was the rapporteur for this uh, uh, regulation, uh, he said that uh, it's a crucial one and it will make us more secure and resilient to external disruptions and to the abuse of energy supply as a political weapon. It gives EU member states the ability to help each other in times of emergency, but also, more importantly, enables them to act jointly to prevent any supply crisis. So is this true? Uh, Andres, let's start from you. Do you think it, uh, is it true? Is it really going to uh, enable us to, to use the important uh, new instrument of solidarity? Well, uh, I think we should look in the context. Definitely, it is a very important piece of legislation. 
because uh, Ege Bozek was former uh, president of the European Parliament and, and chairman of FITRA, and that demonstrates how important this piece of legislation is. But I believe it needs to be looked in the common package that is being proposed by the Commission to create energy union. The current thinking, I would say, the current regulations that is in place is response to two supply crises, 2006 and 2009. So basically it was like actions needed to prevent uh, chaotic actions in the, inside the Union to deal with the crisis. And it was done in a rather fast uh, way. And later on, on 2014, they have been stress tests made that demonstrate that there are still fundamental problems. And then Commission analyzed all the prevention plans and action plans and saw, well, that it could create some additional problems, not to take away the problems that we will be dealing with. So this new leg legislation tries to deal with the challenges discovered stemming from the actions after the previous regulations have been adopted. And in this respect, definitely it's very positive because it is in anticipation, not after the de facto. What are the risks we are facing? I think one risk is classical supply disruption risk because the situation with the transit of Russian gas is still, I would say, sensitive. And we have a, a tw end of 2019 or beginning of 2020, which could be challenging. Uh, but there is another issue that could be related of changes in our energy mixes and that could create additional problems. So that's why I think it was wise to propose a regional cooperation because the challenges that are facing gas markets go beyond just national markets. Then the issue of solidarity is definitely crucial because at the end of the day, each member state uh, has a government elected by population of this country. And when there is uh, some type of suffering, the people say, well, we are ready to support, but what we will get in for us? And what are the rules of the game? So solidarity is definitely unavoidable, but you need really to find the definition. And we have seen how difficult it went with migration crisis. But for me, it was very important. I think one issue that was really very much dealt with is transparency of gas contracts. In previous time, it was such a big commercial secret that no one could embark on it. This time, I think uh, the decision uh, reached about full transparency for the security of supply reasons of the long-term gas contracts uh, is not anymore an issue. And I think that uh, demonstrates that there has been evaluation of this. Uh, so what I would describe to your question, it's definitely a very good step forward. But there is uh, still a lot of challenges, and I hope, I hope that uh, we will not have major supply crisis. But it's better to be prepared in case they are, and that's better not to test this, how does it work in practice, but at least it know if there is a challenge, then we should act like this. And the lessons learned could be applied perhaps in other areas as well. Yes. Very interesting. Thanks, Andris. So, solidarity is unavoidable, uh, says Andris, uh, but uh, what, uh, what are really the news in the regulation, uh, Walter? And what are, do you think, the mechanisms that uh, we thought, uh, you know, might help uh, Europe to become resilient, which, as we know, is one of the targets uh, these days? Okay. Thank you, Ilaria. Uh, <clears throat> I think uh, what is new is that it is the first time uh, an attempt to very much operationalize solidarity, to have a set of very detailed rules, how the solidarity, that's a key part of the European Union and also a key part of the Lisbon Treaty, is put into practice, because we all know that it is a high-level concept that is not that easy uh, implemented unless everybody agrees somehow on what solidarity comprises. Now, the, uh, the final version of the uh, regulation uh, has established a structure of risk groups, basically member states, four groups of member states that somehow have a joint destiny because they are supplied from the same area. Um, and they are now obliged to make uh, 
a risk associated cooperation to establish a cooperation, uh, to have a joint risk assessment, and to jointly establish preventive action and emergency measures. So far, this was a purely voluntary thing. Every member state or many member states had this type of uh, analysis done, and some of them had cooperation with neighboring countries. For example, some countries have their storage, their emergency storage in a neighboring country because they lack their own storage. Uh, but this becomes obligatory now, and also the regulation foresees a very detailed step-by-step -step approach how this is done and how the various groups, the TSOs, NSOG, uh, stakeholders, the Commission, uh, other countries in the risk group are involved. Uh, and that's a first attempt to do so. It also defines commonly three alert levels, early warning, alert, and emergency level, that have certain legal consequences uh, and that also need to be notified to the Commission, but also to the affected neighboring uh, countries. Uh, and it, it uh, establishes regional cooperations on specific emergency supply corridors uh, and it charges NSOG to run simulations how those corridors would work, what alternative supplies there are, and to give a European perspective on uh, uh, analyzing and defining the risk. Now, in principle, uh, I think this is a good thing. Uh, we have to notice sort of two or three points. One is that uh, it's the first attempt to really make operational rules to enforce solidarity that's not there on a voluntary basis. And member states have been rather reluctant to accept too many enforcement mechanisms. So we have a mixture of some enforcement mechanisms, but some areas where the Commission is charged with coordinating and hopefully ensuring that enough goodwill is coming up. Uh, we also have some areas where further intergovernmental agreements will be required, specifically on financial compensation for cross-border emergency support. So if one country runs short of gas, neighboring countries are obliged to offer, but they also have the right for financial compensation, and this financial compensation uh, would have to be agreed up front uh, between the member states. Uh, so that's another challenge, because here you cannot force two parties to agree if they don't want to agree. Uh, but, of course, you can push them and, uh, you know, put some pressure on them to do so. And finally, the whole process is fairly complicated, uh, rather bureaucratic, as, you know, when you let many institutions uh, negotiate about these kind of things, you tend to get a very convoluted bureaucratic process. Uh, which uh, we have to test and see how far it works. Uh, and maybe a final point is the member states have different organizations on who is in charge of preparing emergencies. Uh, and this is recognized in the regulation with the definition of a uh, sort of competent national authority that has to be defined by each member state shortly after the uh, regulation comes into force. And it's foreseeable that these institutions will comprise different entities. In some cases, it will be TSOs. In others, it will be the ministry. And in others, it will be the national regulator. And this group of competent authorities needs to work very closely together, at least within the risk group, uh, and then you know report to the gas coordination group. So this will take some time. And the current timetable for senior the regulation is probably just too short to accomplish all that, specifying the institutions, starting the risk analysis, finding agreement among the member states, uh, but leaving aside that, so it will probably take somewhat longer than the uh, foreseen timetable, uh, I think it will be very important that we are able to make this work uh, and show that solidarity can be uh, sort of defined and implemented in a harmonized way across the EU, even if some countries are maybe not so enthusiastic about the solidarity. And we already saw this in the negotiations, that those countries that are relatively rich on gas and storage capacity were less enthusiastic about some of the measures of forced solidarity than those countries that are more dependent on neighbors too help them out in cases of uh, supply disruptions. So I think we will test the limits of solidarity, and we will also test a process that's 
fairly complicated, uh, but not necessarily unworkable. Uh, and it will be interesting to watch, and I can only hope that everybody involved will be uh, cooperative and constructive in working together, and uh, the Commission will do a good job in coordinating and nudging those people who are maybe not that enthusiastic into uh, a, a practical work of cooperation. Great. Thank you very much, Walter, also for explaining in uh, more details really what are the new elements um, or maybe the most interesting elements building also or some uh, elements from the previous uh, version. Um, so uh, we heard uh, the important uh, point that you mentioned about uh, the uh, responsible authority. Uh, we heard that it actually it can be the, a member, the member state calling for an emergency situation, can be the TSO, the national TSO, even the DSO can call uh, for an emergency. So um, I, won I was wondering, maybe Jan, uh, it looks like uh, that the first uh, level of solidarity or cooperation at least would start from, as Walter also mentioned, from the cooperation between uh, TSOs, neighboring TSOs, uh, which will have to agree on uh, how to uh, start these uh, solidarity mechanisms and before then also to uh, agree on the, on the rules on how uh, the, the, the compensation and how the um, the mechanism in general will work. So, um, what do you think, Jan? Uh, is it uh, good news for the TSOs? And uh, in general, what uh, uh, which positive elements do you see in this new uh, regulation? Yeah, I fully agree that that uh, of course there is a. Uh, um, uh, it's important to get the operational uh, part of this uh, to work, uh, and, and one thing is uh, the, the, the principles on, on a high level, but in, in this case they, they, they really need to be um, uh, transformed and executed on a very uh, operational level, and that's also, that has also been our focus in, in dealing with the, with the, <clears throat> the revised security supply regulation, and, and uh, I think we, are, we, are, we think it's a is a good idea with the with the supply corridors uh, because there we are focusing on the real physical uh, situation for 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 the countries and for our members, and um, it also brings uh, what has been a, an important uh, uh, viewpoint. That it's important that that we are we are establishing corporations where those who are suffering in in a situation. Actually, can get can get get help from from other uh, members in the same uh, area or along the same supply corridor. Uh, so so they are we are leaving members alone without uh, any tools to uh, to react. So I think um, this about we are now uh, have a first an analysis that we are uh, NSOC is delivering first um, risk analysis here in uh, in November where we are going through a number of uh, different uh, potential uh, disruption um, scenarios and, and looking at the consequences. And first, uh, one thing that get, comes out of that uh, could be um, identification of where are there still some weak points in the infrastructure and, and bring that message further on. The other element, uh, it would be, it would bring in uh, some relevant information on where are where do we need to have a strong uh, operational cooperation and and uh, where are the the soft spots and and to to bring that into our our preparations for emergency situation and and for the the part uh, we have now established what we call the RECO teams the regional coordination teams um, organized along uh, the supply corridors and uh, with uh, with uh, all relevant members on on board. And um, and they are ready. Uh, they, they, that will be the very operational people, and they will be able to meet uh, in a virtual meeting room within one hour, where, where wherever and whenever uh, 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 situations are, are are coming up. Uh, so I think that is the first step of uh, of ensuring that it's actually possible to bring out any issues on solidarity and any mechanisms of solidarity on the political and, and the, uh, in between member states agreements uh, in, uh, to have uh, the people who are actually um, uh, running the system and operating the system 
and uh, and we are ready to uh, to go into into that kind of process as TSOs. Great, excellent. Thank you, uh, Jan. So as we heard, it's uh, solidarity is a nice principle. Might uh, might sound a bit abstract, but uh, and, and that's why it's very important that we uh, that Europe uh, finds the the right mechanisms and. Uh, uh, as we have heard uh, also from Jan, the right initiatives to, to make it possible to, to ensure that solidarity can actually take place via cooperation between uh, the, the, the members involved. Um, so, so far we, we talked mainly about the positive points, the positive aspects of the new uh, regulation, so maybe now we could focus a little bit more on what is still missing. So, uh, what is still missing as to enable solidarity, what are the the weakness points the, of this um, of this new um, legislation. Uh, we could start perhaps from uh, Walter, who gave us uh, a good overview of the positive aspect. So now we have to be a little bit more mean, let's say, Walter, if we can. Let's say critical. Right. Uh, well, first of all, there are uh, quite a number of things to do from uh, identifying and nominating the competent authorities to the risk assessment uh, to getting intergovernmental agreements for financial compensation within the risk group settled. So this is a fairly big amount of work that needs to be done. Um, I mean, the estimate of some of the regulators are this is kind of between one and two full-time people uh, to actually achieve that on a national level. Uh, and of course, also some involvement of governments because you know an intergovernment agreement needs to be negotiated among uh, probably a few countries. So a fairly big amount of uh, of work needs to be done under a timetable that's as of today is unrealistic. Uh, I think that one thing we shouldn't overlook is, and maybe this is because it's security of supply regulation and. Uh, very much focused on interventions, that we should not neglect that probably one of the biggest uh, impacts will have uh, a well-functioning integrated market. So the better the market works, the more liquid it is, uh, the less likely it is that we would ever run into an emergency situation. And it's no coincidence that in 2009, those countries with a relatively liquid and deep market were re quite little affected by the supply disruption from Russia, whereas those countries with a single supplier uh, with no liquid market had bigger problems. So I think that's one thing. And the second, of course, is infrastructure. Uh, no solidarity can compensate for lack of infrastructure. So it's very important that all the uh, ongoing infrastructure work that's specified in the TYNDP or the CSEC initiative are pushed forward. Uh, also, the regulation foresees that most of the exemptions from the reverse flow uh, obligations, basically every interconnection point within the EU should be re reverse flow capable. Uh, and there was some mechanism for uh, avoiding that, that most of those exemptions are revoked and that we get uh, the system to be as highly integrated and as flexible as possible. Uh, and, you know, if we improve in this direction, and I think it will also be one of the outcomes of risk assessments that countries with few pieces of infrastructure will have greater difficulties meeting the N-1 criteria than countries with more interconnectors and more sources. So I think it will be a push in that direction. That I see positive. I think on the negative side is we have a number of rather complex actions that need to be taken. A lot of work needs to be done. And enforcement power of the Commission is, I would say, Semi strong. You know, in some areas the Commission could take a decision if the other are not taken. In other areas, basically the Commission can only push member states to do it, but they cannot really substitute the lack of deciding. Um, and it will be seen how if, if these weak or soft enforcement me mechanisms turn out to be. Uh, with uh, I have seen that a number of people from energy community areas, you know, not EU members are also participating. There's a special provision in the uh, regulation that the Commission is charged with trying its best to uh, extend the SOS regulation to energy community countries through uh, changes in the and in the material. Uh, 
Uh, <clears throat> and that would be important because we all know that quite a bit of gas coming from Europe is either transiting or coming from energy community countries. Uh, so to give the best possible uh, preparedness, it's very important to have those energy community countries also eventually covered with the same regulation and work with the EU members on the uh, on a, a similar uh, level of cooperation as among the EU members. Okay. Thank you very much, Walter. So we heard uh, it's important to include also the members of the energy community as to have a wider um, uh, source uh, of, uh, of supply. Um, so as to ensure security of supply, the more the merrier, but also, as we as we heard from Walter, uh, is the, is this issue always comes to the table, uh, is the issue of infrastructure. So uh, um, how to provide uh, su supply via the existing infrastructure? Are they, is it enough? Uh, do we need more infrastructure? Do we have a different um, setting of infrastructure? Uh, Jan, as usual, uh, TSOs, gas TSOs are, are brought in the middle of the yeah. debate. So, um, what's your view? No, I mean we 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 are developing the ten-year network development plans every second year, and and uh, we just launched one the, this spring, and and we are already preparing for the next one. And by the way, that will be uh, with quite a, a tight cooperation with uh, with NSOE. So we will also. Uh, be aligning the scenarios that we are looking into uh, together with the, uh, with the scenarios um, applied on the electricity side, but but uh, I think um, the the general picture that we have seen in the latest uh, TYNDP is that uh, the 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 situation in Europe in general is uh, rather resilient, rather robust, uh, uh, but that there are some specific areas where where the the, the infrastructure is still too weak either for security supply reasons or for, for market integration reasons. So there's still a need in, in, in some, some, in particular in some area. Um, I hope the, uh, the risk assessments that we will bring out here later on will, will further uh, bring a, a, a good uh, background to, for, for identifying where where is uh, where are the the really interesting uh, infrastructure projects in in relation to to security of supply? Um, I could also say that uh, there is a question uh, on whether it is more relevant to to invest in C and D uh, or LNG containers, LNG onshore onshore storages uh, than interconnectors. Uh, of course, I, I agree that that uh, all different possibilities of, of enforcing the infrastructure could be and should be analyzed and and uh, they are analyzed um, and and where LNG and LNG storage is is, uh, is viable and and uh, and there are projects on it so, I mean I remind you that this is not a central planning process it's a it's a collection of, of the projects which have been initiated or are, are being initiated and thereby uh, some of them have been executed but, but so it's, it's more an overall coordination, it's not a central planning. So we will look into what is coming up from product promoters, whether those product promoters are TSOs or other companies, uh, and, and bring that to, uh, into the analysis and look on where, where are the, the best um, uh, enforcement um, uh, placed and the technology behind. So, so I can say, only say that, that of course we are, we are, we are including that. Um, but basically, we can already now see that uh, it, it is in, in, in security supply reasons. We we are mainly seeing the situation or critical situation in, the, in in specific areas of Europe. Most of Europe is actually pretty well off, and I think that was also what Walter was saying that that uh, it has a combination of a lack of infrastructure and lack of market integration, uh, and those two parameters uh, we need to work on. Okay, thank you. And Andris, uh, we'd like to hear your view as well. Where do you see uh, the weakness points uh, in this um, new uh, security of gas supply regulation? Well, I think um, Walter indicated it rightly, because at the end of the day, this type of regulation tries to strike the balance between common sense and subsidiarity. Uh, 
and common sense would say make uh, all the process as simple as possible. And subsidiarity say, no, 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 uh, we need to have the last word on many things. And then there's a question, where does it stand in political priority list? I am coming from the country that is basically, well, should be vulnerable, but there is no excitement. And I know how much resource Ministry of Economy has in general for energy. So this full-time job that is needed now to implement it will be definitely a huge challenge. And it's important that somebody stands with a whip and says, well, guys, we need to move ahead. I think that is the first weakness of the whole process that could be slow and uh, very different in speed in different parts. It is depends on definitely on implementation, but um, I assume Commission needs to think a way how to deal with this. Second issue that I would, uh, would, would make out, I think it's a bit too static because I believe the biggest challenge for security supply is not any more external interruption. I think it is important of internal gas market because demand is not growing and we are putting additional infrastructure. Some of the infrastructure will be less used and somebody would need to for, pay for it for security of supply or it will be, well, some assets that need to be decommissioning. And this is, I think, it's dynamic process. It's not so much static process that you say, well, we have a plan, we should uh, evaluate it each four years. It will be by far more dynamic. And this is something that is a weakness. I am not saying that it should be addressed in legislation, but it should be addressed in practical implementation process. So I really see a huge challenge with the implementation, and I hope that Commission will not be forced to come in some time with infringement procedures. That would be bad message in general, and that would destroy the spirit that is built in this regulation, that is a regulation for solidarity. Right. It makes me smile a little bit, Andres, because I thought that we organized a workshop a couple of years ago called the external dimension of security of supply. Now we should organize one on the internal dimension of security of supply, which we I, I would say really to be right. in the first place. Great. Thank you very much. So um, we have now we are now over the, the first half hour of the debate, and I see that uh, our participants have already started. Uh, um, typing some interesting questions, and I encourage you to, uh, to continue doing so. Uh, the very first one which uh, I, um, that I noticed is from uh, uh, Nicolo Rossetto. It's, it's more actually a wish more than a, than a question. And he uh, wishes that the full application of this new regulation can inspire something similar for electricity as well. Well, it's probably a topic for another debate. Uh, as we know, there are many differences with the electricity market, but of course, um, it's, it's certainly a good wish. Um, do you want to comment on this, or we can uh, just proceed and, uh, and uh, go to the, to the further? further questions, maybe more, more precise? I think it's probably a too complex question. I mean, there is work starting on the security of supply electricity regulation uh, because the, the directive is really more or less useless. But uh, the issues are quite different. I think some of the short-term measures that we are now talking about in gas already exist through uh, the network integration because electricity cannot so easily be stopped on the border uh, differently than gas. Uh, but I think it's probably a, a different debate because there are many aspects to that. I, I would agree. I think it's different debate and it's, uh, it's, it's, I think it can't be addressed in the same way as for gas because as I thought, it's by far, even for gas, it seems to not enough dynamic. For electricity, it will be completely uh, unusable, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, although I must say that uh, el the electricity and gas sectors lately are more and more interacting. This is the topic of uh, um, more and more discussions in Brussels. So probably not on security of supply, but uh, we are likely to see uh, a deeper and deeper integration in the functioning of electricity and gas markets. And by the way, this gives me the opportunity to uh, uh, launch uh, the workshop that we will be organizing here in November, which will uh, um, look at uh, 
the regulatory gaps, let's say, between uh, the interaction between uh, uh, electricity and gas uh, infrastructure. So please keep following us. We will give you more details in due time. Um, Let's proceed with the further questions. Uh, so could, I see Ilari, could, from could I have... Julieta. Yes. Jan. Yes, please. Yeah, uh, just just very, one one very short uh, comment to to uh, to Andre's uh, comment, which I, I very much agree to. Uh, that that uh, I think it's important, as you point out, to, to the, with the interaction between the two sectors. But I think it's a it's a general misunderstanding. If you think that the regulation should be the same, uh, because the, the the two sectors are more different than uh, than you would think, and and the, one of the issues here is that gas is transported uh, several thousand kilometers, and and there you need to have some um, means or some tools in place. Uh, electricity has has a different uh, uh, transportation need, and and uh, is produced closer to the markets. Uh, so so the the situation is simply different. So I agree, more interfaces, interconnection between the two sectors, but it does not mean that the regulation have to be the same. It cannot be the same. Sorry. Okay. As I said, it, we should organize another debate. No, no, thank you very much. It's always uh, interesting to, to hear the different views on this. But okay, let's go back to gas security of supply. I have a question for um, um, Walter Bowles from Jersey Dudek. How do you assess the idea of emergency supply corridors? Do you think this principle is, is manageable? And do you see any shortcoming? <clears throat> well, I mean, the idea is that a country that needs an emergency supply uh, to be brought to the country through a different route that currently does not physically exist or where there is no capacity reserves for this country, has a mechanism that you know these type of uh, emergency supply corridors are established or at least capacity is made available on existing pipelines. Uh, it's an attempt to supplement the um, infrastructure package rules that are more applicable to pipelines that uh, are crossing borders between two countries but become rather difficult to work uh, if there are pipeline capacities only need for emergencies and if there are more countries involved. Now, is it going to be practical? That remains to be seen. I'm not, um, I, I think it's a little bit too early to say it is an attempt to, to get these type of uh, decisions made. Um, normally, uh, issues like that have been come up, but uh, when it gets difficult is when the question arises, who pays for it? Uh, because the idea of emergency or capacity reserved, built or reserved for emergencies uh, <clears throat> is by definition only used very rarely and therefore it is difficult to find somebody to pay for it. So the market will not signal the need for it in many cases. The question is who will uh, do that? Uh, in some cases where the TSOs have uh, sort of wanted capacity and socialized the costs. Uh, but this is an attempt to make sure that if a country is uh, not able to you know, manage uh, the risks properly without additional capacity, there's a mechanism in place to establish this capacity. Uh, we will see. I don't think there are many cases where it will be needed, but there will be a few cases. And <clears throat> I think one has to see in, let's say, two or three years if this really has addressed successfully some of the network problems, uh, or if the network expansion sets needed here run into the same issues as we see in CSEC and TYNDP implementations, that um, it's difficult to find somebody to pick up the cost and uh, have an agreement if the cost and benefits are not equally spread among the participating TSOs or countries. Okay. Do, does any of the other speaker would like to... Um... Uh, want to want to comment? Yeah, I'd like to just to comment that uh, I, I fully agree with Walter that that uh, it is really, really important to 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 follow up on. on uh, we will see how it works. I'm I'm uh, confident that uh, on on the record teams on the very operational uh, side, 
we will be able to make it work and 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 we will also i think it will also we will also be able to show that actually the tsos will be able in practice to 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 handle quite a lot of of uh, what is needed to to be to be done i think the the the, the one of the big things will be can we can we get good, uh, operational cooperation with the with the um, with with the political uh, levels in the member states, uh, and also cooperating and and have the interface with with, the, with our record team set up. That will be a, a crucial uh, element to to look into. But it will work in the end. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Then I have a question which is more on, let's say, gas as a commodity. Uh, from Dan Ruten, he says it would be interesting to hear the debate participants comment on the different roles that gas plays in their state's energy mix, uh, particularly in relation to the residential sector, because this encompasses most of the protected customers. Uh, as we know, the uh, choices of the national energy mix uh, go uh, beyond uh, the European rules, uh, but it's a fact that uh, uh, there is a big variety in the choices that uh, every member state uh, does. So how do you think this uh, um, relates to uh, the provisions, for example, uh, concerning exactly pro protected customers uh, in, the new, in the new regulation. Um, how many protected customers uh, there are in one member state uh, compared to the other? Uh, as we know, this, it, there isn't a general agreement on, on the categories uh, in every member state. Um, uh, should Pater? I? Pater? Yes. Should, yeah, I can answer that. I mean, first of all, the regulation recognizes that gas has a very different role in different countries. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, in some countries, gas is used mostly for industrial purposes and power generation. In other countries, there is a very large number of uh, gas household customers that use gas for home heating and, and also cooking. So there's a, a different relevance. To allow for that, there is some flexibility for the member state or the competent authority to define who is a protected customer. Uh, <clears throat> now, to avoid the situation where one country would declare everybody a protected customer, uh, which in the regulation would have the consequence that neighboring countries would be obliged to support them, uh, maybe at the detriment of some of their own customers that are maybe only to a small share uh, protected, there is this definition limit that you cannot declare more than 20% of your gas consumption as protected for these cross-border emergency measures. On a national level, any member states can consider everybody important and uh, protected, but if they want to call in emergency measures from cross-border uh, points, then they are limited to this 20%. Now, uh, I think what we will see over time that the number of people directly affected or in a very severe way affected by a gas supply disruption will change. So this needs to be uh, adjusted from time to time. Uh, but I think there is a fair amount of flexibility. And just one tiny example, in Finland, which has a single gas supplier, namely uh, Russia, with the exception of some LNG work, but in the past it was a single supplier they forced everybody who uses gas as a heating uh, fuel to have an alternative heating possibility installed in their house. Uh, so for them, a supply disruption of gas is not very serious because everybody has either pellets or wood or oil or something. Uh, in other countries, that's very different. So there are differences, but they are recognized in the regulation and I think can be reasonably well uh, taken care of in the current uh, system that's proposed. Well, I think it's, it is a relevant question to the whole debate because each of member states uh, should invest heavily on the greenhouse gas emission uh, reduction. So that would mean more uh, particular investments in energy efficiency and also more renewables being integrated into the energy mix. I know also the gas industry and Eurogas meeting, I think this year will, will focus on renewable gas or, or really ch keeping gas, but with by far better environmental characteristics. But 
I believe that is why we need to be dynamic in the whole situation. But going backwards, I think we, we can't really punish some particular member state that it uses gas more than another one. It has mm -hmm. historical reasons. There have been some decision taking, uh, taken, and we should somehow exclude this in the calculation of solidarity, because if we go this way, then we will make this compensation for something that, well, would be very difficult to explain. So I assume that uh, each member country will have a less gas in its energy mix by 2040, 2050. But if the gas industry will find a way how to work with uh, uh, renewable energies, transforming it into the clean gas, uh, that could be different. So it is really something to be watched uh, and uh, at the same time really to reflect on it all the time on security of supply measures. Okay. Thank you. Um, I would then combine two questions uh, because they both relate to infrastructure and then I suppose Jan will be answering uh, as first. Um, one is from Andrei Bailey. Is it more economically relevant to invest into compressed natural gas or LNG containers and LNG onshore storages than into additional interconnectors? because often new interconnectors are not wished or used. And the second question is from Frédéric Rosier. Why such a focus on physical reverse flow at every IP? Often commercial reverse flows and or physical flows through third countries bring the same level of security. What's your view on uh, these two points, Jan? Uh, LNG, I, CNG, I already commented slightly on the first one, saying, yeah, yeah, of course, if, if it's a relevant uh, alternative. In the, I mean, you have to remember, that this is, again, this is not a central planning process that we're doing. It's a, uh, what we're doing in the TYNDP is that we're collecting, we're collecting all uh, the, the infrastructure projects which project promoters want to uh, invest time and money into. And, and uh, so, so it's, uh, we say there are no invention of specific uh, projects uh, from a European level. That is not happening. What we are only providing the overview and transparency. And then, of course, these uh, alternatives are, are, are relevant. And to the other question regarding the, um, the commercial reverse flows, uh, of course, I mean, that is, uh, I, I think the, the security supply regulation is meant as a last resort. We're, we are setting up a system which provides uh, a, a possible last resort for ensuring su uh, supply, but the market have to uh, to do uh, to deal with the with the issues in the first place. And it's it's only when the market and the commercial uh, possibilities are not are no longer uh, enough uh, sufficient, then um, then the security supply regulation and, and the systems will will come into work. Okay, clear enough, thank you. Uh, let's go on with another question from Maria Olczak. Do you think that the proposed transparency mechanism, so that the companies notifying long-term contracts uh, relevant for security of supply, will actually work in practice? And I have to ask this question first to Andres. No, I, I have no doubt it will work, because uh, I think it was more taboo in, uh, in perception. So I have no doubt that it will work. No company would like to be later on in trouble because they have forgotten to notify the contract. No, I, I would exclude this. I think it's, well, they, some bad people exist in this world, and, and, uh, but I, I don't see that anybody would play with this because the consequences of legal and also technical consequences are just too strong. I, I believe it will work. Any uh, comments from Walter or uh, Jan on this? Yeah, I would support it. I think in the, let's say, up till about five or seven years ago, this was a very big issue. I think today the content and you know the main components of all the long-term supply contracts are basically known to most insiders. So there, there's no real any secret. Maybe the ultimate price details are, but they are not really that relevant here. But the rest is pretty clear. Uh, and I think everybody has now accepted that, you know, this is no longer a tightly held secret, uh, but, you know, it's sort of part of the normal commercial operation. And uh, as far as it's relevant for security of supply, it has to be notified to the respective authorities. 
This, if, if I may also ask a question, this uh, um, makes me come up with a follow-up question. Is, do you think, to what extent do you think more than the, the fact that companies will actually notify the long-term contracts, do you, to what extent do you think the problem of um, uh, bringing simultaneous information, so timing, as we know, is also very important. Um, do you think this might have a, an influence in and create possible asymmetries in the market if, for example, uh, some uh, the Commission is informed uh, later or, or uh, you know, uh, also, and I'm, I'm uh, expanding this uh, issue, also this question, to uh, the the change of status when an emergency is called. Uh, how important it is that all the parties in the market are simultaneously informed when there is a problem, and how can this be solved? I, I think the idea is to have a very sort of well-established uh, network of uh, competent authorities, including the Commission, uh, and of course the TSOs that would be very quickly uh, informed about it. I believe that after some startup, because you know you need to establish this cooperation and the networks and everything, it, informing should not be an issue. Of course, a country might be reluctant to declare an emergency status, uh, but I think nowadays with all the close to real-time information available on gas flows and things like that, it's fairly easy to assess the situation in every country, even if the country doesn't itself immediately notify everybody. So I think the information with the transparency rules that are now being uh, enforced, even some of them are already existing irrespective of the uh, SOS regulation, I think the information will be pretty much out. Now the assessment, if a country feels this is serious enough to declare an alert or uh, an emergency, that remains to be seen. I mean, it is a very severe decision on a national level. Uh, on the other hand, if you have the opportunity to get cross-border uh, support, uh, but only if you declare an emergency, mm. you will be very reluctant to avoid declaring it because you're giving away a possibility to get some support. And if it afterwards turns out that somebody had to be disconnected or there was some damage, but could have been avoided if you had declared an emergency in time, I think everybody responsible would be under massive pressure uh, to basically resign and you know because they messed up the whole thing. So I think after some initial time that it will take to get everything operational, it should work reasonably well. Uh, now, if the timing foreseen in the process of the SOS regulations are is quick enough or not, that remains to be seen. I mean, the TSOs are rather quick. Uh, we have, you know, some if, a few days uh, for some of the other things to happen. I think we have to, to see how it works in practice. And I, I think in this context, I put a lot of emphasis on the training, uh, on the not training, on the, on the uh, sort of simulations that are required in the SS regulation. Uh, I've done in Austria a lot of uh, security of supply simulations over the years, and it's extremely uh, useful to do that because you find out much more quickly what problems are and maybe ways around that than by just doing it on the paper. If you really sit down people in rooms, okay, now tomorrow morning gas stops slowing, what would you do? Uh, so these things are quite important and I think technical issues will come up, but overall I'm not so pessimistic that these notifications no, I, will not I, I agree with Walden in, in, in this, uh, and, and uh, a lot of things are going on on this. Uh, one thing is the transparency that the simulations will, will bring. Uh, another thing is that, that uh, the the NSERC transparency platform is, is, uh, is, is there with quite a lot of information on capacity and gas flows, uh, and, and uh, it will is, um, still uh, in, uh, improving and and uh, and developing its scope, but uh, I think people will be quite uh, um, amazed if they don't know it. Uh, go go onto the transparency platform and look for this information. You'll uh, achieve quite a lot. I know it's not about the uh, supply contracts. This is about the 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 transportation and the actual physical flow. But at least that will be a big part of of uh, getting the picture right. Okay. 
Good, good to hear. Uh, thank you. So we, I probably have time for one last question, uh, as we are only five minutes away from the end of the of the debate. Um, from Andreas Kost, are member states allowed to apply price cap on solidarity gas from neighbors, given that it is ensuring supply for protected customers? I guess this relates uh, will probably have to be discussed still in the context of the uh, compensation uh, debate. So how how to establish compensation uh, for this uh, for this solidarity? So probably the details will still have to be discussed and agreed upon. But uh, um, maybe uh, uh, you would like to comment or provide uh, an answer to temporary answer probably to this question. I think After. if anybody could do it is Walter perhaps has an idea. <laughs> <laughs> so I I definitely can't imagine how it will work. I mean, the, the, the regulation says something like cost-based, so you are not allowed to, uh, let's say, misuse the emergency situation by, say, charging three times the, the gas, so that would be excluded. Um, I mean, price cap, uh, it's more the question, who bears the added cost? Uh, I think the, the countries will offer, hopefully on a cost-plus basis, their support. I think they will be under a lot of pressure not to overcharge. So if they bought the gas for, I don't know, 15 euros, then probably selling it for 18 is fine. But selling it for 100 probably would be considered excessive and would result in some legal action against them, even if maybe the country uh, using it would have to pay it initially. Uh, now, to what extent the end user has to pay for that, that's a separate issue. You could either say, well, this is socialized or the government picks it up in the budget or does however. But I think uh, the, the possibility to overcharge massively is excluded in the regulation. Probably there could be made a good argument that if there is a shortage in one country, then the overall market price level would go up so you can charge a little bit more for it, which is good anyway because we need to motivate the countries to actually provide the gas, even at the detriment of some of their own customers. Uh, so I think that it will be an interesting debate among the member states, uh, but I don't see it as unsurmountable. Okay, clear. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, before concluding, uh, I, let me just uh, uh, do a little bit of advertisement for FSR. As you can see here in the box, uh, and our first online course on gas uh, is going to start very soon. Registration is open. Um, there, there will be um, uh, many uh, gas advisors and experts of the Florence School of Regulation participating in this uh, in this course, giving lectures. Uh, it's a very interactive course, so I'm, I'm sure uh, uh, our uh, fans, our followers who are familiar with the, uh, our online course structure will, will be able to appreciate it. Uh, it's directed by me and by Michelle Alak uh, from Brazil. She used to be a, a researcher here a few years ago and now is working in New York for uh, the World Bank. Um, Yes, so we look forward to the next online event. To conclude, uh, really, just to answer the, the question that we initially asked, so solidarity and security of gas supply, the impossible match, I think we can say that it's not an impossible match, uh, that solidarity, uh, the, the very the, the, let's say the big news of this uh, new security of supply regulation seems to um, to fit quite well. Uh, yes, okay, in this regulation there are probably some, some still uh, some open points, compensation, and maybe uh, coming to an agreement will take longer than expected, but we are positive uh, that uh, uh, this new uh, mechanism will work, and hopefully it will serve as an inspiration also for other sectors who know electricity or even migration for Europe. Let's hope so. Let me thank uh, all of you for participating, all the participants spread uh, all over the world. I hope it was useful. And of course, our speakers, our experts who devoted their time to help us understanding a little bit better this uh, big news in the security of gas supply for Europe. Thank you, Jan. Thank you, Andris and Walter. And uh, thank you, we count on you, you for the next developments. <laughs> OK, thank, right. you thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye.